Well, good evening and welcome to Revisiting the Founding Era, hosted by Carroll County Public Library and sponsored by the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History and the American Library Association. Before I introduce this evening's uh, special guest speakers, I'd like to uh, introduce the library team. I'm Dorothy Stoltz with Carroll County Public Library, Director for Community Engagement. And we have uh, Shelby O'Leary this evening with us, who's, who works for the communication de Communications Department. And she uh, will be our tech production person tonight. Thank you, Shelby. Um, Shelby and I will be monitoring the Q&A. So if you are joining us by Zoom, uh, if you hover your uh, cursor at the bottom of the Zoom screen, you'll see a Q&A icon. And when you click on that, a uh, screen will pop up and you can type in your question or comment. If you're joining us from Facebook, please use the chat box. This program will be recorded and posted to the library's YouTube page where you can find it to watch it again, share it with friends or family, but we'll be archiving it there. We have received a grant from the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History and the American Library Association, which is enabling us to give away a free book to participants. Uh, and these are the uh, three books available. Uh, if you email me, dstoltz at carr.org, and let me know your first, second, third choice. Uh, this is all while supplies last, but first, second, third choices of the, those book titles and uh, which Carroll County Public Library branch you prefer to pick, pick up your, your book. And um, so let's get into, I, I wanna say how honored the library is to be sponsoring tonight's program. And we're very appreciative to the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History and the American Library Association. We have some local partners that we've been working with in planning uh, this program, and that's the Carroll County Public Schools and an initiative called Celebrating America, which is something that came out of um, the Carroll County Commissioner's Office. And there, it's a group of uh, organizations, educational groups uh, focused in on uh, history. And uh, so we're real pleased to have them as sponsors. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Judge Joe Getty with the Maryland Court of Appeals. And we have three panelists this evening, Sam Riley, Union Mills Homestead, Dr. David Greenspoon, Gerstel Academy, and Alex Losty from the Maryland Center for History and Culture, formerly Maryland Historical Society, uh, but their new name and focus is uh, the Maryland Center for History and Culture. So I'll turn this over to Joe. Thank you, Dorothy. And we welcome all of our participants tonight in this, a second panel discussion about We the People, America's Founding Vision sponsored by the Carroll County Public Library. As Dorothy explained, the Carroll County Public Library received grants from the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History and the American Library Association for this evening's program. The theme, Revisiting the Founding Era, is derived by a book from the Gilder Lehrman Institute that explored per personal documents in the founding era. The book includes letters and essays from the period 1760 to 1810, and they explore the personal feelings and thoughts in this critical period of history where our country declared independence and established a rec representative democracy. The selected writings demonstrate that there was much controversy in forming a new government and that many emotional differences of opinions existed across the colonies in how to structure a new government. Our first approach in this program, which we did as a webinar in May, was to focus on the founding era in Carroll County, 
We did so by examining the lives of four leaders associated with early Carroll County, David Shriver, Colonel Joshua Gist, Francis Scott Key, and Captain Samuel DeWeese. And we discussed how their lives represented the founding era's enduring ideas and themes. Tonight, we're going to broaden our focus. The last two chapters of the Gilder Lehrman Institute's publication review primary documents that led to the crafting of the United States Constitution and the process of governing a new nation. We're going to take a parallel view to that, but from the perspective of Maryland and discuss the themes in crafting the Maryland Constitution in 1776 and the early issues in governing the state of Maryland. By the time the delegates had gathered in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787 to draft a United States Constitution, they had the benefit of the experience of 13 states that had crafted their own state constitutions most of them 10 years earlier, and the experience of the early governing of state, each state by state. Many of the delegates in 1787 to the Constitutional Convention had also been delegates to their own state constitutional conventions or were leaders in their state during the ensuing 10 years of governance. What was Maryland's position on independence in 1776? The issue was hotly contested and Maryland convened leaders from across the state gathered in Annapolis in 1776 to advise the Maryland delegates at the Continental Congress. Initially, the Maryland position was to seek reconciliation, to come to an agreement with Great Britain upon terms that respected the rights and liberties of the American colonies. Over that spring and summer, early summer, the delegates uh, changed their mind. They stuck to the reconciliation position until June 28th, when the state convention in Maryland informed their delegates in Philadelphia that Maryland now supported a vote for independence. This group in Maryland issued their own declaration of the delegates of Maryland on July the 6th, not knowing that the convention in Philadelphia had issued the Declaration of Independence adopted by the Continental Congress on July the 4th. Thus in Maryland, the next step after releasing their own declaration of delegates was to elect 78 delegates to attend a constitutional convention in Annapolis, which convened in August of 1776 with the purpose of adopting a state constitution. David Shriver from Westminster, at that time part of Frederick County, was one of the delegates to that convention. And we've asked Sam to give us some insights as to David Shriver's experience as a delegate to the Maryland Constitutional Convention of 1776. Thank you, Judge Getty. I appreciate the, uh, uh, the lead in. And uh, uh, I, I should note as we I start this evening that I'm speaking to you tonight from uh, the hearth, the kitchen hearth at uh, David Shriver's home, uh, west of Westminster, Maryland, where he uh, uh, lived most of his, a good part of his life and then died in 1826. Uh, in, on this farm, which he settled in 1760, he raised a large family that included several notable Frederick, now Carroll County area residents, including Andrew and David Shriver Jr., who were the founders of the Union Mills Homestead. Uh, in the last session of this program, when we were talking about David Shriver, I I reviewed how he rose to be from being a the son of German immigrants to be a member of this constitutional convention in 1776. And those who were elected that summer in 1776 to the convention to form this convention were truly the founders of Maryland. They they selected the form of government that would uh, govern our 
state going forward. I'm going to share with you a slide, uh, a, a photograph image of David Shriver that will uh, at least give you a sense to uh, visualize what he looked like. So there he is. And I, I should note that he was certainly not a, a zero in terms of net worth or real estate holdings. He uh, owned several hundred acres here west of Westminster. Uh, but it is worth you know, kind of going back and putting it in context that in 1760, when he settled this, this area, he had nothing uh, and spoke very broken English. And uh, uh, in 1776, he lived in a simple log house. And so he was definitely different than a lot of the other uh, delegates to the Constitutional Convention. He was a farmer, uh, tanned leather and, and milled and represented the many German speaking residents in the Frederick County area. Uh, so if I'll go forward one slide and, and it's when you, you look at this next slide, it's interesting to contrast David Shriver with the others who served with him in 1776. Um, I, I guess I should note at the beginning that um, none of these individuals were paupers, not by a long shot. Um, and they were all of course, white males. Uh, but you look at the demographics for the group, it's, uh, it's you know, may, maybe as obvious today, but they were all property owners. They all owned land. Three quarters of these individuals owned more than 500 acres. Charles Carroll, Samuel Chase, William Pack, and Thomas Johnson owned on average over 17,000 acres each. And as a group, these delegates to the Constitutional Convention in 1776 owned almost 10% of the land in Maryland. And I, I should note that 66 of the 78 uh, who represented the state in this constitutional convention uh, owned slaves. Um, this, this list that you see here is who was actually present when the convention started, when it first met in August of 1776. And it's notable who was not on this list. Charles Carroll of Carrollton is not on this list. William Packa is not there, nor is William, or excuse me, Thomas Johnson. None of them got elected in the initial election to serve as delegates. And it was only later that Carroll and Packa were subsequently selected to represent Annapolis. And Thomas Johnson was selected then as a replacement for another member who uh, uh, had to resign from Caroline County. But uh, of significance, over half of these individuals who served in the August, uh, in August of 1776 and then, then into the fall were new to the scene in, in Annapolis. Uh, several of them had served on other conventions, statewide conventions. Most, over half of these had not, had served on various committees, uh, committees of observation and so forth, but they were certainly new faces. The majority of them were, were certainly new faces. And then if we go forward one slide, um, as they met that summer and fall, this is what they prepared, this Declaration of Rights and Constitution in form of government for the state of Maryland. And so this was the document that established all the key things that we know today, you know, the separation of powers, uh, things in the criminal arena, for instance, the right to uh, not have to testify against oneself and uh, freedom of the press and freedom of religion, things like that. Um, but if you go forward one more slide, um, you'll, what you see is that um, at the very beginning of the Declaration of Rights, it, it kind of came out with this kind of very nice sentiment that was stated right there at the beginning that, uh, that the form of government was going to be founded on this concept that it originated with the people, that the power that it was a government of the people and by the people. And that certainly was a nice sentiment. But as we can see from much of the debate that happened at the time, there are certainly is a legitimate question as to whether the leaders in this uh, convention truly meant that to be taken literally. So um, we can take the slides down um, now. Um, I think that uh, what happened in, in 1776 at this constitutional convention more than anything, it was fiery debate. It was it was hotly contested all the way through, uh, and and I, I guess at the end of the day, what really mattered is that the wealthiest and most powerful members of the convention really 
decided what was going to happen. Uh, there was some real concern among folks such as Charles Carroll of Carrollton that they had unleashed a popular sentiment that really could not be controlled. And um, the, these individuals, again, Packa and, and Chase, Thomas Johnson and others were of concern that, uh, you know, something, they had unleashed something, a Pandora's box that they, they were not quite uh, sure they, they were pleased with. Um, they were more cosmopolitan in their approach to things, but there was an opposition who disagreed with them. They were motivated more by populism and by issues that were more local in nature. Um, in uh, August of 1776, Charles Carroll wrote that uh, he was concerned that the people had become too focused on forms of government and liberty, and uh, they should be instead focused on preserving order, authority, and stability. And then he continued saying that uh, the opposition against him and the others were, uh, they were, they, or he rather, he was opposed by the designs of selfish men who were striving to throw all power into the hands of the very lowest people. And then he continued about um, expressing concern about schemes urged by his opponents. And that unless vigorously counteracted by all honest men, Anarchy will follow as a certain consequence. Injustice and corruption in the seats of justice will prevail. And this province in a short time will be involved in all the horrors of an ungovernable and revengeful democracy and will be dyed with the blood of its best citizens. So you get the sense that Charles Carroll and some of these others were a little concerned about what was happening. Um, but it was interesting about what the most divisive issues were. Uh, and one of the most hotly contested issue, issues was who would get the right to vote. Um, I mean, that's certainly a, a logical dispute. We're still fighting over that today. Uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit more and a little bit farther in the program. But a second issue that was a sleeper, I, I guess, was um, transparency. And it was you know, interesting that that would be something they would fight about so much. So. But it was, they, they were very heated discussions about what information would be divulged to the public, how often and how carefully their votes would be recorded and that the drafts would be published um, and the public would be allowed to see what was happening behind those closed doors. So that was definitely a, uh, a heated subject of uh, discussion. Bottom line though, the more wealthy conservative bloc had their, their way, they were able to prevail on most issues, although there was some compromise and the uh, initial constitution that resulted, although it is indeed one of the most conservative state constitutions that was established in 1776, you know, in this very first uh, effort at democracy, uh, there was some progress made on issues such as voting rights. So um, while there was some, dis there, there was some progress uh, we'll talk about some of the uh, disputes that surrounded that progress in, in kind of the next block. So Judge Murphy, back, to, uh, Judge Getty, back to you. The uh, transparency issue is, is pretty fascinating. David may bring up uh, later that uh, in Philadelphia for the U.S. Constitution, it was conducted all proceedings entirely uh, private. Uh, there was no one allowed in except the delegates. And they were pretty tight lipped about what was going on inside. People were trying to find out what was being crafted for a US constitution in this gathering of, of delegates. And it was uh, a very private. Uh, of course, there were no public information laws at the time. Um, and uh, Alex is going to tell us a little bit about how people did get information uh, as to what these proceedings were. and generally about political issues of the time. There was no Facebook, there was no Twitter. Uh, we didn't have to worry about the censorship of social media, uh, but um, there was a vehicle and that was uh, through the newspapers. Alex, tell us a little bit about the time when the uh, Maryland Constitutional Convention was going on in the early years in governing Maryland and Annapolis. Yeah, of course. Um, so. Uh, newspapers were always a very important part of the colonies. Um, you know, that was the only way you would get information was by reading the newspaper. Um, just to give a little bit of background, the first successful newspaper in America was in Boston in 1704. Um, 
but uh, by 1740, there were 16 newspapers uh, in the British colonies. By the time of the American Revolution, there were about 37 newspapers in business in the American colonies. And what's interesting about the newspapers at this time is each newspaper had its own, in a sense, personality. Um, some printers were postmasters, some were booksellers, some were printers who did other kinds of printing. Um, some were, some talked about the news, some were more literary, um, but they, they all kind of had a standard format um, and that was all based off the London papers. Um, Generally, early on, they were about two pages, but uh, later papers are going to be four pages long um, with one large sheet kind of turned into four, four pages. Um, but what's, what's interesting about newspapers and the news uh, in the early American period is that we say our news is partisan um, today, uh, but news back then was, was highly partisan. Um, you know, before, like during the American Revolution and, and right after, you have papers that such as Whig papers or, or Tory papers or Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers that are really only telling that side of the story. They're only telling their side. And people tended to subscribe to these newspapers reflecting their views. So if you were just reading your newspaper, you were only going to get what the newspaper editor uh, wanted to tell you. You were only gonna get the politics of the party or the individuals that they supported. Um, and, and this actually helped kind of shape political discourse early on in American history. And what's interesting is that the, these newspapers and their newspaper and uh, these newspapers and their editors carried massive weight on the public and their decision making. And in Maryland, uh, we had two very interesting uh, newspaper editors um, who, who you wouldn't find in most other states. And, and the two major newspaper editors and printers in Maryland, uh, right before the American Revolution and right and in, in during were women. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is Anne Catherine Green, and the second one I'm going to talk about is Mary Catherine Goddard. And these two women held enormous power over how people's decisions were made on whether to support the, the Maryland Constitution, whether to support the American Revolution in general. Um, and so just to give a little background on Anne Catherine Green, she was uh, thought to be born in Holland in about 1720. Um, not much is heard about her until 1738 when um, uh, her husband and her um, start moving, they begin to move to Annapolis. Her husband, Jonas Green, was actually a printer in Ben Franklin's print shop in Philadelphia. Um, and he comes to Maryland and becomes the printer of the province. So he is going to be printing basically all the major governmental documents. So whenever the General Assembly or the House needed something printed, they were going to go to, to uh, 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 Jonas Green. And uh, he becomes a printer of the province in 1738. Um, and as, as the printer, he held enormous power. You know, he was, like I said, he was going to be printing items for the government. He was also going to be printing items for people to look at and buy. Um, they can come to, they could go to his print shop and get the materials that they wanted to. So people could actually uh, see what the government was doing. It was a sense of transparency. Jonas Green was a terrible businessman. He was a good printer, but a terrible businessman. Um, he was in debt, uh, deeply in debt when he died um, in 1767. But in 1745, he starts, I should say, restarted the first Maryland newspaper, uh, the Maryland Gazette, also kind of, it's the Capital Gazette today. Um, the Maryland Gazette was originally founded in 1727, um, and it was published until 1734, and then Jonas Green starts it back up. Um, but when, when Jonas Green died, uh, Anne Catherine Green took over printing of the Maryland Gazette. Um, she completed all the printing jobs. She uh, uh, commissioned by the province because her husband was the, the printer of the province. Um, and she maintained printing of the Maryland Gazette and actually tried to uh, create a better business for the Maryland Gazette. Um, and she, she, she turned the business around. She turned the paper around. And in 1768, she actually is appointed uh, the printer of the province. So she is the printer of the province. She's doing the same thing that her husband did, printing the, the news of the government. Um, but the, the Gazette served as both a reflection of an influence over local thought on anything from what stores to patronize to understanding the events that led to the revolution. Um, and, and it was once described as one of the most important institutions on the Chesapeake Tidewater. Um, so this is 
the first newspaper in Maryland. It is the only one that is being circulated in Maryland. If you are able to read, I should say, you are going to be reading this newspaper. Um, not everyone was able to read, but if you were able to read, this is what you would be reading. It was the only newspaper until 1773. And what's interesting about um, uh, Anne Catherine Green is, is she was actually very bipartisan. She never really commented on the events of the paper on her own. She made it, she made it her practice to uh, maintain neutrality and she allowed people on both sides of the debate to print um, within her paper. And uh, uh, she was, she, she did decide who was gonna be printing or what political debate was gonna be printed. So she was called the gatekeeper of political debate. So this shows how much power she had as the only newspaper in Maryland. This is what you were gonna read um, as the printer of the province, you were going to see exactly what documents the government was printing, and Anne Catherine Green was going to decide what people saw. But um, one of her most important decisions that she ever made was to print the Antillian and First Citizen letters. And these were letters about eight and all, published from January to July of 1773. And it made up a debate between Charles Carroll of Carrollton, uh, who was the first citizen, and Daniel Delaney Jr., who was Antillian. And they're both, uh, both these men are Maryland politicians and they're debating in the paper what power should or should not be allowed to be in a representative government, what, what powers the government should have. And this debate had a significant impact on Maryland politics as well as shaping constitutional debates that emerged forming the, the United States as an independent nation. Um, and, and in printing these letters and encouraging the exchange between uh, of these letters, she, uh, Anne Catherine Green was instrumental in forming the nature of political debate in the colonies and in Maryland. So as people were trying to figure out what is going on in the American Revolution, what the new country should be like, uh, where to fall, um, Anne Catherine Green is providing that to both sides. She's allowing this debate to happen. Um, Charles Carroll was more, uh, he believed that the, uh, the, the uh, power should re uh, remain more in like, in a sense, uh, kind of the British style, um, while Delaney was more of the representative style. Um, and so that's the debate that is happening in front. Um, and, and you can actually find those letters online. Um, and, and Anne Catherine Green, uh, Green she, she passes away in 1773. Um, but the, the Maryland Gazette still continues to be printed. Her, her sons are taking over. Um, but another major printer and another major newspaper uh, that came out was that of Mary Catherine Goddard. And she printed the Maryland Journal of Bal and Baltimore Advertiser. It was the only newspaper published in Baltimore during the American Revolution. Um, and it was one of the, it was a reliable source of news. So if you were around Baltimore, if you were in uh, what would be Howard County or Carroll County, um, and you could read, you're probably going to be reading the Maryland Journal and Baltimore Advertiser. She starts this up in 1773. Um, she is also the first female postmaster in Baltimore. Um, so she is uh, in charge of the post. Uh, she is in charge, or she's having a say in, in how newspapers are being sent out. Um, she's born in 1738 in New London, Connecticut. Um, and she's actually, she spends a lot of time, she learns how to print because her um, brother is a printer and they're moving around and he's also not very good at printing. So she has to pick up after him and, and kind of, he would print in one city and then it wouldn't really work so he would move to another city and and Mary Catherine Goddard would have to stay in that city and clean up all the financials and finish the paper while her brother would move on and so they come to Baltimore um in in uh 1768 um I, I take that sorry I take that back in 1772 uh, is when they come to Baltimore um and William Goddard uh, uh Mary Catherine's brother starts a new publication the Maryland Journal and Baltimore Advertiser he becomes bored with that. So he focuses on setting up the, the post system. So Mary Catherine Goddard takes over and she's printing local news and advertisements, rewards for runaway uh, slaves and convicts. Um, she's also printing revolutionary and wartime pieces. So she's printing a lot during the American Revolution. And one of the most interesting pieces she prints is on uh, uh, April 19th, 1775. She published a letter to the editor uh, from, it, uh, the, the name was Britannicus, which argued that 
The British Parliament claims a right to tax and bind the Americans in all cases whatsoever, when in reality, a British Parliament has no more right to tax an American in anything than they have the right to tax the people in Japan. For by this means, you are robbed of the democratical, that was their words, part of the Constitution, the very essence of English liberty. So you can see that, uh, unlike um, Anne Catherine Green, this paper is very much pro uh, uh, breaking away and anti-British, I should say. Um, and then the, the the next week, she publishes a, a she prints a speech uh, saying that if we can tax the Americans without their consent, they have nothing which they can call their own. Um, and then on July 10, seventeen seventy six, the Maryland Journal publishes the newly agreed upon Declaration of Independence um, under the title "The Thirteen United States of America Have Declared Independency." So you can see that the debate that that Mary Catherine Goddard is is showing and putting out there is influencing people in Maryland. And um, in terms of Declaration of Independence, she's actually incredibly famous for printing the first Declaration of Independence with the signers' names on it. Um, she prints this in, in 1777, January 18th, 1777. Um, basically, they didn't want to print the Declaration of Independence until um, 1777 because uh, George Washington kept getting pushed back, kept getting pushed back. Was getting uh, pushed out of New Jersey and into Pennsylvania, um, but when Washington crosses the Delaware, the Continental Congress is actually in Baltimore, and they ask um, <clears throat> they ask uh, Mary Catherine Goddard to print the Declaration of Independence, and so when you look at it, you see all these men's names, and then right at the bottom, you see Mary Catherine Goddard. So she is the only woman on the Declaration of Independence, which is really really interesting. We actually have an original copy in our museum, um, but despite paper shortages, she keeps printing, and she was a staunch patriot. She she believed that Americans had the right to declare independence. She believed that they should um, uh, they should uh, uh, fight for, for the rights. But um, she also believed in freedom of the press. So in 1777, she published two anonymous contributions uh, that had a Tory tone. Um, and this angered many Baltimore residents, uh, including the Whig Club, um, which was organized for the protection of the citizens from Tory influences. Um, so they are very upset. They demanded to know the identity of the author. Mary Catherine Goddard refuses to tell them and refers them to her brother who had given her the letters to print. Um, and they were gonna banish William Goddard from the colony. Um, they Actually from the country, I should say. They were gonna banish him from the, the country um, and uh, they had to write, Mary Catherine Goddard had to provide a character reference for uh, for him so he wouldn't get banished. But you can see as a newspaper editor, you know, if you were trying to put both sides out there, you had, you were putting yourself at risk. Um, I should say she also ran a dry goods store in the stationary business. And in 1775, she was appointed the Baltimore Postmaster. Um, what's interesting is about her job as a postmaster is she's there when, like I mentioned, the, the government is trying to figure out how to get news out to people. And she is the postmaster when they set up a relationship between newspapers and the post office that allows newspapers to be shipped fairly cheaply. Um, but she was actually kicked out of her position in 1789. Um, the official reason was that the postal system was being consolidated, but the, more, the unofficial reason was that the postmaster would require more travel than can be expected of a woman at the time. Um, so they kick her out. Over 200 Baltimore businessmen actually petitioned for her to stay. Um, she writes a letter to President Washington, but was told that uh, I, being Washington, have uniformly avoided interfering with any appointments which do not require my official agency. She, she, she's actually one of the first people who was kicked out of a position based, uh, based on politics. Um, she never regained her position. But what's really interesting is that in Maryland, the people who were showing, who were being transparent and were making the decisions and, and showing what people thought in the colonies were two women who had immense control over what people would see, what they would hear, and how they would see it. And it's fascinating thinking about that in terms of who has rights and who has power at that time. Because you don't see any women at the Constitutional Convention. You don't see any women. Uh, uh, Margaret Brent tried to get the right to vote in the 1600s and she's denied that right to vote. Uh, women aren't going to get the right to vote until 1920. But yet when it comes to the moments right before and during the, uh, during the Revolutionary War, it is two women in Maryland who are 
telling people what is going on. And so that that idea of of uh, who has power is kind of interesting because political power, uh, women didn't have any, but printing power and power over the public, Mary Catherine Godwin and Catherine Green had immense sway. It's a very interesting topic in, in early Maryland uh, political history, uh, the control and, and power that they had. And it sort of resonates in current events uh, with regard to who controls the message that is distributed among, among the public. I wanted to uh, briefly address uh, some of the hotly contested issues um, that both Sam and Alex have, have uh, talked about. And uh, it, it focuses around the issue of um, how do you transition from a monarchy, uh, a colony ruled by a king, um, to a representative government? And uh, that was what the uh, colleagues of David Shriver in Annapolis were attempting to come up with. Um, one of the key elements was to have um, three branches of government uh, and to have a separation of powers. And I thought I'd talk just briefly about um, the judiciary under the Maryland Constitution of 1776. But first I'll say something about the US Constitution in 1787, because um, after meeting in private and drafting uh, the Constitution, uh, it then needed to be sold uh, to the American public. Um, and as Alex has explained, uh, the main uh, messenger was newspapers. And uh, so the public, public relations campaign for the US Constitution um, were letters to the editor or essays uh, known as the Federalist Papers. Um, a series of essays uh, typically circulated as letters to the editor to explain the foundational legal concepts to the public at large. Uh, one of the uh, Federalist Papers, number 78, was um, uh, published under the pseudonym Publius, um, but written by Alexander Hamilton. And he, he comments on judicial power under the US Constitution he says the judiciary is incontestably beyond comparison, the weakest of the three departments of power. Hamilton explained the executive not only dispenses the honors, but holds the sword of the community. The legislature not only commands the purse, but prescribes the rules by which the duties and rights of every citizen are to be regulated. The judiciary, on the contrary, has no influence over either the sword or the purse. Hamilton then emphasized the judiciary from the very nature of its functions will always be the least dangerous to the political rights of the constitution. Over time, that has proven to be wrong, especially after the Chief Justice uh, John Marshall issued the opinion in 1803 of Marbury versus Madison, which established the precedent of judicial review of constitutionality for acts of Congress. And uh, we've heard a lot about uh, the Constitution and the role of the Supreme Court uh, over the last month as we look back at uh, the creation of the Constitution and the role of the judiciary. But in 1776 in Maryland, one might agree with Hamilton about the judiciary in Maryland. The transition under the new constitution was difficult in some regards and perhaps not so difficult in other regards. You would think you create a new government, the legislature now has to create a body of laws, but that wasn't the case under the Maryland Constitution in the Declaration of Rights, the state adopted the English common law as the law of the new state. So in terms of laws, there was a seamless transition of uh, 
the continuance of the English common law. For the most part, the judicial structure also remained the same in under the Maryland Constitution of 1776 as it existed under the proprietary government. There were county courts, there was the general court at the state level, and there was a court of admiralty for uh, issues involving maritime pursuits, just as they had existed prior to 1776. The major change was the creation of a court of appeals as the highest appellate level review in the state. Prior to this, under the proprietary government, appeals were heard directly by the proprietary governor and his council. So there was no separation of power between the executive and the judiciary. In fact, the executive uh, had control over appointing a council and the executive himself and the council were the final word on legal appeals. Under the new constitution then, we have a separation of powers that was installed as the fabric of government. An executive branch consisting of a governor elected by the people, a legislative branch with two chambers, a house of delegates and a state senate elected by the people, and a judicial branch with judges appointed by the governor to the county courts, the state courts, and the courts of appeal. I'll note uh, an, an interesting uh, sort of carryover. Uh, it's an answer to a trivia question that may earn you something in, uh, in a trivia contest somewhere. There are only two states that still use um, the uh, founding era term, House of Delegates, for their legislative chamber that is the lower house. All of the other states call their state chamber the House of Representatives, but Virginia and Maryland continue to use the colonial language and the founding era language of House of Delegates. There are also only two states that call their highest court for appellate appeals, the Court of Appeals. Those two states are Maryland and New York, all the other states have adopted uh, the US Constitution terminology of having a Supreme Court of that state. What the Constitution in Maryland of 1776 did was it directed the governor to appoint to the judiciary persons of integrity and sound judgment of the law, and that for the Court of Appeals, their judgment shall be final and conclusive in all cases of appeal. The initial constitution then failed to specify the number of judges for the Court of Appeals. A similar lack of provision in the US Constitution is a topic of discussion in current events today. Nor did the state constitution specify uh, terms and other specifics for the administration of the court. Because of that, there were differences of opinion between the House of Delegates and the State Senate into resolving some of these details. So that the appointment of the first judges to the Court of Appeals was delayed for two years until 1778. And then there was difficulty in finding judges to serve under this new format uh, under the state constitution. So it was uh, almost four years after the adoption of the constitution that the Court of Appeals held its first session. I offer this short illustration of establishing the court system in Maryland to show that there was difficulty in the mechanics of governing under the new constitution. But more importantly, it was establishing the uh, three branches of government and the separation of powers, a critical component in the yet to be created uh, US constitution. So David, um, Maryland and the 12 colonies that simultaneously became states in 1776 all crafted their own state constitutions. How did all this brain power influence the Articles of Confederation and the later adoption of the US Constitution in Philadelphia? Sure, so the US Constitution, thank you very much, Judge Getty. Uh, 
The U.S. Constitution was not created wholly out of the imagination of the 55 men who met at Independence Hall in Philadelphia in 1787. And we, you had mentioned the secrecy regard, um, surrounding the proceedings of the 1787 Constitutional Convention. And one reason why they kept it secret was they didn't want people to gain knowledge that they could use for speculation and get unfair economic uh, advantages. But rather, the US Constitution and the Bill of Rights that followed were inspired and informed by the constitutions of the 13 states, which, which originally made up the United States. In the drafting of uh, state constitutions between 1776 and 1780, leaders of the revolutionary era contested the shape of the nation and the meaning of independence. At our last panel discussion a few months ago, I discussed competing meanings of the revolution and how some Americans envisioned a more radical transformation of the country, which other founders feared. And in 1794, after the Constitution and the Bill of Rights had been ratified, when Colonel Joshua Gist put down a Whiskey Rebellion in Westminster, Maryland, both Colonel Gist and the Whiskey Boys he defeated, and the Liberty Pole he destroyed of theirs, they both sides likely saw themselves as protecting what the American Revolution was fought over. But these disputes were not just played out in the streets of America's towns and cities. These differing visions of what the revolution meant and what kind of nation we were building was played out in state constitutions drafted in the late 18th century. Indeed, before the National Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, state governments were already spelling out what individual rights needed to be protected. The Virginia Declaration of Rights was found, written by founding father, uh, George Mason, and was ratified along the, alongside the state constitution in the spring of 1776. 11 years before the US constitution was drafted, it protected many individual rights that were later enumerated in the US constitution. For instance, the right to face your accuser in court and a speedy trial protected by the Sixth Amendment to the US Constitution is also protected by Section 8 of the 1776 Virginia Declaration of Rights. And indeed, the right to face your accuser in court goes back way further than that. It's a part of English common law and uh, ancient Romans had this right as a part of their, the Roman legal system. Um, Freedom of the press, enshrined in our First Amendment of the United States, but it was also Section 12 of the Virginia Declaration of Rights. Indeed, decades later, I mean, the importance of the uh, freedom of the press was um, emphasized by the Founding Fathers. Thomas Jefferson, who was a great admirer of the Virginia Declaration of Rights, from which he borrowed considerably for the Declaration of Independence, wrote to uh, the Marquis de Lafayette in the later years of his life that, quote, the only security of all is in a free press. The force of public opinion cannot be resisted when permitted freely to be expressed. The agitation it produces must be submitted to. It is necessary to keep the waters pure. Indeed, in the 21st century and the later 20th century, the federal government is often seen as the guarantor of personal freedoms, especially and um, correctly on account of us seeing the world through the lens of the modern civil rights court movement and the importance that the Warren court played in this. But the founding fathers saw both federal and state governments as protectors of liberty. To give some local context, Maryland too, in setting up its re uh, Republican form of government in 1776, included a declaration of rights that borrowed from the Virginia constitution and set out rights in our state, such as the right to free speech in Section 8, or the protection of from excessive bail. This part, these Declaration of Rights for Maryland, were a preamble, an opening to the Maryland Constitution. The Maryland Constitution, I would argue, also set out structural frameworks that we see in the US Constitution. The Maryland Declaration set out that we have, as Judge Getty mentioned, mentions that there were going to be three branches of government that would be permanently kept separate. 
Moreover, the state of Maryland preceded the U.S. Constitution in setting out lengthy terms for senators. U.S. senators are, of course, six years. In the original 1776 Maryland Constitution, it's uh, five years. Also, like the U.S. Con the original U.S. Constitution uh, before the 17th Amendment, Maryland also spelled out that state senators would not be de elected democratically, but each county would send electors to select state senators. Therefore, the 13 state con but the 13 state constitutions that preceded the 1787 federal constitution should not be understood as merely rough drafts or car earlier carbon copies of the US constitution, even though Alexander Hamilton had sought to win New Yorkers support for the US Constitution by telling them in Federalist Number One that what they were proposing with this Constitution was an, quote, analogy to your own state constitution. Rather, earlier state constitutions offered an opportunity to debate just how radical the outcome of the American Revolution would be, just how much power would be handed over to ordinary Americans, just how many safeguards would be installed to prevent mob rule. The exemplar of a state constitution that handed over extraordinary powers for that time over to ordinary people with few checks on that power would be the Pennsylvania Constitution of 1776, which was more radical in its promise of democracy and equality for the US than the 1787 US Constitution. For instance, rather than just giving suffrage to landowners, it guaranteed voting rights to all men who paid taxes. It had a unicameral legislature with representatives elected every year. The framers of Pennsylvania's constitution viewed an upper chamber to the legislature as a vestige of a house of lords the very form of government they were rebelling against. To give an idea of the great equalizing spirit that surrounded the creation of the Pennsylvania Constitution, a clause that was ultimately rejected went even further, declaring that, quote, an, an enormous proportion of property vested in a few individuals is dangerous to the rights and destructive of the common happiness of mankind. And therefore, every free state hath the right by its laws to discourage the possession of such property. Moreover, the Pennsylvania Constitution contained no checks and balances on this legislative unicameral body that was directly represented by the people. There was a judiciary, but the justices, judges could be removed by the state legislature. One historian noted that, quote, by, the, by late 1776, and by the, by the end of 1776, I believe 10 of the 13 states had already drafted constitutions, but it was Pennsylvania's 1776 constitution, they, the historian said, that, quote, embodied the more radical spirit of mass democracy, which, um, do, 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 do. oh, I'm sorry, the quote was, by late 1776, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania was perhaps the most vital participatory democracy in the world. Pennsylvania's 1776 constitution embodied the more radical spirit of mass democracy, which many common folks, like perhaps those whiskey boys in Westminster, saw in the revolution, and which, but which many founding fathers feared would descend into mobocracy, rule by the mob, mass rule. And although the founding fathers favored representative government and, and governments that stemmed from the people, many of them feared mob rule. Indeed, the radicalism of Pennsylvania's 1776 constitution would spark a pushback when other states um, drafted their state constitutions. And there was a lot of division within Pennsylvania, a lot of opposition to this constitution. Uh, Declaration of Independence signer, Dr. Benjamin Rush, told uh, Timothy Pickering of Massachusetts that, quote, 
the new when uh, he, he said this uh, in 1787. Uh, he expressed hope that the new federal constitution would temper the radicalism of Pennsylvania's constitution, telling Pickering that, quote, the new federal government, like a new continental wagon, will overset our state dung cart with all its dirty contents and thereby restore order and happiness to Pennsylvania. Fear of mob rule also drove uh, founding father John Adams and second president John Adams later on in his life to seek out a more conservative constitution that was still based on popular sovereignty, but it would avoid mob rule. John Adams had for a long time um, shown concern about mob rule and more um, comfort with the rule of law. Early in his public life, when Adams defended the British soldiers following the Boston Massacre in 1770, he derided the Americans who had been fired upon by British soldiers in classist and racist language as, quote, a motley rabble of saucy boys, Negroes and mulattoes, Irish teagues and outlandish jack tars. As Adams' characterization of working class Bostonians suggests, elites saw a danger in giving too much political influence to these ordinary working class Americans. And indeed, Adams feared what was going to be unleashed in, with Pennsylvania's 1776 Constitution, uh, noting that it was so, quote, so democratical that it must produce confusion and every evil work. So in contrast to Benjamin Franklin, who had been working on drafting the Pennsylvania Declaration, Adams saw virtue in an upper house in its legislature. Rather than seeing it as a leftover of nobility, he believed it would act as a break on any unruly actions by the uh, lower house. And indeed, he would advocate for other state legislatures to include an upper house. And indeed, the radicalism of Pennsylvania's state constitution was short-lived. And you see more conservative state constitutions following. Uh, like the New York Constitution of 1777 or the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780. So although the 1776 Pennsylvania Constitution was supposed to be a final word on the Keystone State's fundamental framework, it didn't last long. It was supplanted by, it's by 1790 by a new constitution for the state that more closely followed the lead of Massachusetts's 1780 constitution. However, the spirit of a more radical uh, democratic system did not die completely. Vermont's constitution, the 14th state, would draw inspiration from Pennsylvania's constitution. Vermont's constitution was also radical in that it was the first to abolish owning enslaved adults. As Robert F. Williams noted, the Pennsylvania experiment in a democracy without checks and balances, and with more power in the hands of more people, stands as an important step towards what developed in 1787 in Philadelphia and the drafting of the US Constitution. Even if for many founding fathers, the Pennsylvania Constitution constituted uh, a cautionary tale, an experiment in too much democracy gone wrong. Thank you. Thank you, David. That's, uh very good perspective for our consideration of the Maryland issues. And you did touch upon uh, Vermont's constitutional provision for enslaved individuals. Uh, Alex, uh, tell us a little bit about um, what was going on with the free black enslaved population in Maryland during the founding era. Uh, give us some idea of the cultural dimensions of this population. Yeah, of course. So. Um, you know, when we talk about the Maryland State Constitution it, and, and its, its moment as a, it, as it, it being a momentous uh, document um, to Maryland's history and, and the founding of the nation, you know, we, we also need to look at who's left out and who's, who's not there. And, and that is going to be um, women and black men and women. Um, and so just to give a little bit of background, I, I do want to note that 
black Marylanders, men specifically, did actually have power early on. Uh, some of them did have power really early on, but that would have been taken away from them. Um, and I'm going to address that a little bit later. But so for some some background, um, the two first black men in Maryland or people of African descent uh, arrived in 1634. We only know one of their names. Uh, his name is Matthias de Souza, and he was an indentured servant. Um, and then he became free. Um, he participated in the General Assembly. Uh, I should say in, in the meetings, he existed as a free Marylander. He had the rights of a, a Maryland man. Um, at that point, you know, the, the race didn't play a, a factor. Um, and early on, it was Mar in Maryland's history, European and African indentured servants were working on farms together. After years of service, they would be let free and, and would own land. And the owning land, especially for the early indentured, uh, early black indentured servants is going to be important a little bit later on. But African slavery in Maryland began in 1642 when the first 13 enslaved Africans were brought to St. Mary's City and sold into slavery. From that moment on, slavery is going to go into and become entrenched in Maryland. And I should note in the colonial doc in the colonial documents, um, uh, they started uh, the the white colonial uh, uh, delegates, I should say, started putting more and more laws on uh, the rights of Black Marylanders. In 1661, they restricted miscegenation or the marriage between different races. In 1663, the Maryland Assembly passed a law requiring all Blacks that were brought into the colony to be presumed to be slaves unless they could be proven that they were indentured or free. And in 1664, they ordered that all enslaved individuals and the children of enslaved mothers be held into slavery. So in slavery was entrenched in Maryland leading up to the American Revolution. And it is going, uh, enslaved Marylanders are gonna be working on tobacco plantations on the Eastern shore. They're also gonna, they might be working in, in Baltimore town as it was known uh, in the shipyards or the, the few shipyards that were there at the time. Um, they might be working in Southern Maryland. Um, they might be uh, uh, in what was early on urban slavery. So more working in smaller houses, not that didn't have farms, um, but in slavery was entrenched in Maryland. And in 1776, when the Maryland State Constitution was passed, it stated that every man having property and a common interest with and an, an attachment to the community ought to have the right of suffrage. So basically, in 1776, the Constitution of Maryland allowed all men the right to vote if they were landowners. That meant Black male landowners could vote. Um, there were very few, but Black male landowners had the ability to vote early on. They had to stay. Um, that's gonna change and I'm actually gonna talk about one individual who would have had the right to vote early on. Um, but I first wanna talk about the American Revolution and the role that black men, black Marylanders played in the American Revolution. Because when you look at the role of enslaved and free in Maryland during this time, you tend to think about um, mostly enslaved and working on plantation, but you're not thinking about the free black men and the enslaved black men who fought for the rights who fought for the uh, American independence and didn't receive it. Um, so we do know about, uh, while this is Virginia, Lord Dunmar uh, uh, made a proclamation that any enslaved individual, if they joined the British army or if they escaped to the British army would be free. So you did have enslaved individuals in the, on the Eastern shore and, and in Southern Maryland who took up that offer and went to the British army. There were black British regiments um, after the war, most of these, uh, many of these men go to either Nova Scotia, Halifax, or they can go back to England. Um, and so they are, uh, in a sense, free. I should note when they went back to England, um, these, these uh, former British soldiers, these black British soldiers were not receiving equal pay and equal benefits as the white British soldiers were. Um, and so many of them were in poverty. But in Maryland, um, during the American Revolution and during the founding era, uh, the Continental Congress believed that Maryland could fill eight regiments. Um, in 1776, between the Maryland line and the flying camps, especially the ones that came out of uh, uh, Frederick or the Frederick County areas, um, this wasn't an issue. It was very easy to fill eight, eight regiments. Um, they had no problem. But by 1777, Maryland faced issues uh, despite offering bounties for money and land. In, 70, in 1777, Maryland didn't receive enough uh, 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 sufficient veterans or new recruits to fill their lines. So as a result, they began opening up enlistment to black men. A 1778 document uh, from August uh, 24th of 1778, um, which is 
uh, showing the return of, of black soldiers in the Continental Army, Maryland is listing, listed as having 95 uh, black soldiers in her ranks. So there are 95 black men fighting in the Maryland ranks of the Continental Army. Um, these men were gonna be in the early Maryland line. They weren't at the Battle of, of Brooklyn or Long Island, depending on what you call it. Um, but uh, by 1778, you're gonna have black men in the ranks serving next to white men. Um, these men were fighting for the ideals listed in the Maryland Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. They were fighting for freedom. They were fighting for rights. Most of these men, I should note at this time, are free men. These are free black men who have joined the Continental Army. Um, enslaved men, in, unless they escaped, uh, would not have been able to join. Um, but in 1780, with more with more numbers needed, Maryland began allowing all any able-bodied enslaved men age 16 to 40 to volunteer to fight in the Maryland Regiment. And I should note by volunteer, um, they would volunteer. Uh, they would be volunteered by the by the plantation owner. Um, the plantation owner might receive a bounty, uh, be, uh, bounty that a normal soldier would have received. Um, these men weren't going to be promised the land or the money afterwards. Um, if they were, uh, if they were signed up, um, there was a provision that if someone captured a, a enslaved individual and brought them to sign them up. Um, and they couldn't prove that they were the owner of that enslaved individual, that enslaved in individual would be free um, and able to, they would have to serve their service, but then they would be free. That didn't happen very often. But um, you have black men being forced to serve in the ranks. These are enslaved men being forced by the plantation owners to serve in a army fighting for the ideals of liberty and freedom. If that's not hypocrisy, then, then you know, who knows what. But it was, it was um, there was debate about it. And in 1781, the Maryland legislature thought about raising an all black regiment. Um, and this was incredibly popular. Um, and me but many legislative uh, members, including Charles Carroll were opposed to this as they believed it would hurt the economy because the enslaved individuals were driving the tobacco economy, which was the main economy of Maryland at the time. The all black regiment was never raised but Thomas Stone, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence from Maryland, um, believed that, an, that uh, all African-Americans should be free, stating that he had never known a single instance of a Negro being contented in slavery. Um, and he believed that at that moment, all enslaved individuals should be free. They should be able to fight in the regiment if they want, but the black regiment was never raised. But black men fought for the American independence uh, but despite their sacrifice, freedom after the war, slavery still existed in Maryland. Um, but nevertheless, black landowners, the few that there were, still had the right to vote, which was more than other Southern states allowed. Um, Northern states had provisions, uh, but Southern states, slavery was still entrenched. Um, and in 17, uh, the Maryland Constitution of 1776 was amended almost 66 times. Um, and a major change for black landowners happened in 1810 when the General Assembly changed the terminology in the suffrage section from free men to free white men. From that, um, from that moment on, all black men lost the right to vote. So the only individuals who had the right to vote in Maryland were white landowners, um, generally wealthy. And I wanna focus on one individual because I find him very fascinating and he is from uh, uh, Oella or what would be Oella. Um, and he would have had the right to vote. And uh, his name was Benjamin Banneker. Uh, Banneker was born in 1731. Um, he lived near Oella, Mar Maryland. He was actually the son of a white woman named Molly and a free slave named Robert. So his mom and dad were actually going against the 1661 anti-miscegenation uh, laws. Robert uh, bought 100 acres of land and listed his son as the co-owner. So from that moment on, Benjamin Banneker was a landowner. Um, his story is spectacular, and and he is one of the. He's not talked about too. He's not talked about a ton, um. But between the founding of the United States and and the Constitution and and a little bit after that, he's at, uh he's fighting against what a lot of free black men and and black enslaved individuals are suffering from in the sense that he is challenging the idea that of the of the uh hierarchy in terms of of. Um, the mind. Um, a lot of white men, uh, a lot of white individuals believe that they were smarter than black men, 
and and uh, Benjamin Manneker is challenging that. And at age 22, he builds his first striking clock entirely out of wood. Um, he becomes friends with George Ellicott when they move and start building their mills. Um, and uh, George Ellicott gives him a telescope, drafting tools, books on astronomy. He becomes a skilled he becomes skilled in astronomy and surveying. And he's so skilled that actually Major Andrew Ellicott hires him as an assistant to help plan out Washington, D.C. So a free black man who has the right to vote is helping plan out the new capital where they are going to write where the Constitution and government would sit that wouldn't allow black men and women and white women the right to vote or have any power. So that's kind of an interesting story. But um, between 1792 and 1797, he produces an almanac. Uh, it's important to Maryland, uh, but uh, it's important to Maryland because it predicted the tide to the Chesapeake Bay, which is where you had a lot of trade. Um, and U.S. Senator James McHenry remarked that ben, uh, Banneker's Almanac were fresh proof that the power of the mine are disconnected with the color of the skin. Um, Banneker sends his Almanac to Thomas Jefferson, urging him to recognize the humanity of Black Americans and improve their condition. He uses his Almanac as proof that African Americans were intellectually equal to white Americans. And instead of doing anything about it, Jefferson was so impressed that he sent the Almanac to the Academy of Sciences in Paris and didn't actually end slavery in, in the United States. But Banneker passed away in 1806. So when he passed away, he still had the ability to vote in Maryland. Under the constitution, he still had the ability to vote. He still had power. Um, but many black Marylanders didn't. After the American Revolution, a lot of uh, slave owners, a, a decent amount, freed their enslaved individuals, and a growing community, a growing free Black community starts forming in Baltimore. Um, Baltimore is going to have the largest free Black community of any Southern city um, at, until the start of the Civil War. Uh, these free Black men and women uh, and children, I should say, are, are growing Baltimore. They are uh, uh, creating uh, communities in Baltimore. They are heavily involved in the shipbuilding that's happening in, in the Baltimore area. Um, they are sailing up and down the Chesapeake, bringing trade. They are going out west to uh, Western Maryland to, to start working in mines, start settling uh, uh, other uh, de developments. Um, and so you have this growing free black population in Maryland. And, and many people ask, well, why didn't they just go north of the Mason-Dixon line where they would be free? Um, and that is because they were settled in an area that they knew people. They weren't going to just move to Philadelphia if they didn't know anyone. Um, and there are records of people having the ability to move. Uh, they're free. They can cross state lines, but they don't because their community is in, is in Maryland. Um, I do want to note that um, uh, there was attempts. You know, they didn't have, they didn't have power. Um, uh, they didn't have the right to vote, but it is important to note that Black men and women, mostly enslaved, tried to grab the power on their own by escaping north, by escaping plantations, by moving out. Um, and, and, and that in its sense, in its own, is a, is a way to see how the, the community is changing, right? It, people are recognizing that, at least enslaved individuals are recognizing that there is a big difference between what is going on in Maryland um, and what is going on in Pennsylvania. And enslaved individuals are escaping north. Uh, just to give you a number right before the American Civil War, and I know that's uh, ahead of what we're looking at, but just to give you a number, there are 87,189 uh, uh, Black men, women, and children who are still enslaved in Maryland. So um, uh, the tobacco plantations start dying down after the American Revolution, and slavery starts to die down in Maryland, but enslaved individuals aren't being freed. What's going on is they are being sold down south, where the cotton plantations are starting to boom. So slavery is not, it's dying down, not out of the goodness of enslaved owners' hearts, but because they can make money selling enslaved individuals down south. So it's important to recognize that as the American Revolution and as the Constitution are being passed, you have people who are getting their powers taken away from them, who are getting the ability to have a say taken away from them. Um, and then they're just existing in Maryland. And the policies for free black men and uh, women and children the policies based around what they can and cannot do aren't being decided by them. They're being decided by wealthy white men who are in the General Assembly or in the, in the um, government. And because of that, they have no say, they have no power, and they are starting to just try and find their own community and, and 
create um, their own power within that community. You have uh, in the in the early 1800s, you have the first black shipbuilders union created. So they're trying to create power that way. Um, that is highly disliked by members of the white shipbuilding union. Um, but the community is starting, the black community in Maryland, the free black community is trying to create their own power while the enslaved black community is forced to work on plantations, but trying to gather their own power by escaping north of Pennsylvania where they are free. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating history and a part of, Amer of Maryland history that uh, is sometimes unrecognized. Uh, Alex, we're running uh, towards the end of our program. Okay. I thought I'd uh, ask Sam uh, to tell us a little bit more about uh, David Shriver's role in Annapolis in uh, adopting a constitution, but also his role then in governing the, the new state. Thank you, Judge Getty. So um, in discussing, in framing David Shriver's service in that period, uh, from 7076 forward, you, you do need to look at that convention and kind of where it, uh, uh, what the starting point was. And uh, it's certainly a contrast, Maryland's constitution to the, the uh, very much more radical Pennsylvania constitution that David discussed. This Maryland's constitution was very much one of the more conservative constitutions that were adopted in the uh, founding era. Um, and it's certainly uh, the case that Maryland's government was controlled by these very wealthy and powerful individuals, and that was no accident. Um, the form of government that they, they established very much was focused on making sure that people of great wealth and um, uh, who owned extensive property were the ones in government. And um, if you look at the, the, the Constitution, what it, first of all, in order to be elected to serve in that convention, you had to be a free male over 21 years of age, having no less than 50 acres of land with a value of at least 40 pounds sterling. That was just to, to be on that constitutional convention. And this you know, limit disenfranchised almost half of the, the uh, heads of household in the state right off the bat. Uh, as we discussed earlier, voting rights were very much a, a hot topic of con uh, discussion at the, the convention. And there were several efforts made to try to, to eliminate or to lower those property qualifications. They were, um, they went back and forth and eventually they did arrive at a compromise that basically cut those property qualifications in half. But there were other qualifications that were baked into the system. For instance, to serve, in government, you had to meet other property qualifications. So to, to serve as a, in, in the House of Delegates, you had to have uh, 500 pounds uh, of, of uh, worth. To serve in the to serve as governor, you had to have 5,000 pounds of uh, net worth essentially to serve. So even with a, a broadened vote, there were limitations on who could serve in government. And uh, one other note, all, all voting that did occur was by voice. Um, one key takeaway of that Maryland Constitutional Convention and in the years that followed was that, that uh, there was an opposition that was very much focused on populism and on increasing power to those who had less power. Um, and uh, there was, a, of course, the, those in power who had, had more money and, and privilege. And those, that kind of uh, early tension in the system developed over time into the political parties that were known in the era of the constitutional founding as the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, and then later as the, the Federalists and the Jeffersonian Republicans or the Democratic Republicans, as they were sometimes called. And, um, and then in 1800, we had that first peacetime transfer of power between the, uh, when Thomas Jefferson was elected. And so David Shriver was definitely on the, the more radical spectrum uh, of uh, opposing the, the Federalists and served in government in the House of Delegates in the, the State Senate for a period of almost 30 years. Uh, and um, Dorothy, if you could put up that uh, slide that I gave you for the second session. And um, it's, it's kind of worth noting this, this one headline that um, 
um, was published in 1802 in a, uh, uh, as the result of an election that year in which the, there was a, an effort made and it was successful to change who got a chance to vote. And it basically did away with these property qualifications in, uh, in 1802 to lower um, the, the uh, qualifications. And it's interesting, it was not as much looked at as, as being a great victory for um, you know, in giving the vote to more people, but it was a, in rather looked at as a mortal blow to what was called federalism in this county. So it was almost more a political um, uh, achievement than anything. Uh, thank you, Dorothy. Um, and so the supporters of Thomas Jefferson, in, including David Shriver, made this, this universal suffrage a, uh, uh, and the secret ballot, by the way, a major part of their campaigns in 1802 and 1803. And then relying on those, that, that populism, they were successful in, succeed, in defeating uh, Democrat, uh, the, the Federalists in uh, uh, the elections. Um, and, but it's, again, it's ironic that it took almost 150 years after that time until the, the vote was extended all the way to, um, um, not just to women, but through federal civil rights acts in the uh, 20th century to, to all citizens of the country. So it's, it is, uh, you know, they're, they're watching this development is, is interesting. And then I'll add one little footnote that uh, um, many of these, these papers, the, the Federalists are, and, and the Republican papers had these essays that David described, but the, the uh, the essays that Andrew Shriver wrote in the local uh, Jeffersonian publications did not use such lofty um, pen names, but rather they used uh, pen names such as a farmer um, to kind of give the context of the uh, difference in, in who they were representing and what their interests were. So anyway, it took 150 years before the, um, uh, the vote was expanded, but uh, you know, even today, you know, whether it's good policy or not, you know, certainly it's good policy to vote, um, it seems that many of these early elections, it was looked at more as uh, uh, almost secondary to gaining political power through the ballot box. Some things never change. Back to you, Judge Getty. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I hope our audience has uh, enjoyed the program this evening as much as I have enjoyed participating with our panel uh, who's done an excellent job introducing uh, some of the themes of the founding era, uh, both in Carroll County, uh, the state of Maryland, and as they applied to uh, the U.S. Constitution. And with that, I will turn this webinar back over to Dorothy Stoltz and the Carroll County Public Library. Well, thank you, Joe Getty. And I want to thank our panelists and, uh, and Joe for your um, moderating. Um, this was a superb um, conversation around a number of these topics and really appreciated how you brought local to Carroll to Maryland and then to um, uh, the colonies and, and the early, early nation. Um, I do want to mention that the Essential Hamilton does have uh, some of the Federalists, including number 78 and number one that uh, uh, Joe and David had referenced. Uh, so just a reminder that uh, we do have, uh, you know, this wonderful grant money that we can um, uh, send a free book to one of the Carroll County Public Library branches to you if you just email dstoltz at carr.org. And let's see here, we're just gonna close this out uh, by once again, um, thanking our sponsors, Gilder Lehrman, the American Library Association and all of our wonderful local sponsors. So thank you so much for attending.